So the Bible is a very interesting book in that it is essentially split up into six or seven different parts. There's the Torah, or the law, there's the history, there's the songs and the poetry, there's the prophets, and even that can be split up into major and minor. Then there's the gospels, and then there's the acts of the apostles or the letters Paul's letters. And then even Revelation, if you want to split that up into its own part, can be sort of a seventh part. And while these seven sections do tell one grand narrative, they're not necessarily in chronological order. You see, the Bible is such a mystical and interesting text because each new section of the Bible we read only deepens our understanding of what we've already read. All that being said, I think that if you're new to the Bible or new to Christianity, then the perfect place to start with reading the scriptures is to go straight for the Gospels. If this biblical narrative had a climax, these four books would be it. When we begin with a foundational understanding of the Gospel, we will gain a clearer understanding of how every other part of scripture points to the person and life of Jesus. Because you see, Jesus only appears physically in the flesh in four of the 66 books in scripture. But the idea of Jesus and the idea of a savior and the spirit of Jesus is breathed all throughout scripture through prophecies and foreshadowing. And when we begin with the gospel, we're much more likely to understand those prophecies or those foreshadowings that are talked about, and we're going to be able to put them in context with the life of Jesus. But that leaves another really quick question, and that's, what gospel should I start with? Well, I'll just give you a quick rundown of all four, and sort of the Cliff Notes version of what they all are, to me at least. There's the Gospel of John, which is my favorite for obvious reasons. There's the Gospel of Mark, which is the shortest, so if you're into brevity. There's the Gospel of Luke, which is possibly the most specific and it has the most metaphors and teachings, so if you want to be super thorough. And then there's always the Gospel of Matthew, which is probably the most famous and the most referenced. So I would say whichever one of those four books speaks to your personality type, start with that. That's right, we're not just doing one question this week, we're tackling three in one video. Call me crazy. Do it. So some of you who follow me on my personal YouTube channel, subscribe. You know that I keep a list of 100 life goals on my computer. And one of those life goals is to read the Bible in seven different translations. So for me personally, I like to use a bunch of different translations for a couple different reasons. One, because I have a goal and I wanna reach it. And more importantly, number two, is I believe that it helps to deepen my understanding of the text. You see, the Bible was not originally written in English. Not even in ye old King James English. The majority of the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, and the New Testament was almost entirely written in Greek. And these two languages, Hebrew and Greek, are really difficult to translate directly to English. For example, while we only have one word, love, to describe all kinds of deep affection, the Hebrew language has up to five or even more words to describe all different types of love. Conversely, there are many Hebrew and Greek words that are so rich and deep with meaning that we don't have a single word that encapsulates all of that, but rather we have to use an English phrase or several English phrases before we can really encapsulate all the true juice and meaning of the word. And this is why a lot of the English translations that we read can differ so much, is because it's really hard to translate exactly from Hebrew to English or from Greek to English. And since most of us don't speak fluent Greek or fluent Hebrew, I think it's important for us to look at a bunch of different translations so that we can get a bunch of different interpretations so that we can deepen our understanding of the text. Because the deeper we dig into God's word, the deeper God's word digs into us. 
So my advice, try out several, cross-reference a bunch of them. The important thing is to be open to God speaking to you through all of them. So before we talk about how we can read the Bible more consistently, we should tackle why we should read it in the first place. Psalm 1, verses 2 through 3 say this, He whose delight is in the law of the Lord, who meditates on his law day and night, that person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do, prospers. So we see that consistency of study in God's word brings about peace, provision, and prosperity in our minds and in our hearts. And that doesn't mean that once we start reading the Bible, we're never going to have any problems ever again. But rather, what it means is that we will have peace within the storm. We will have spiritual provision in the midst of our physical need. We will have a prosperity that is deeper and more full and more life-giving than the earth can provide. But now the question, how do we get more consistent? Unfortunately, I don't really have any sort of magic formula that I can give you to drink to make you a theologian who just loves studying scripture all the time. Developing the spiritual discipline of scripture study is like developing any other discipline in your life. If you want to get in better shape, you have to eat right and you have to work out. If you want to be a better singer, then you have to sing every day. If you want to write a book, then you have to write every single day. The only difference with scripture study is that oftentimes we don't see our progress in such a physical way. When we're going to the gym, we see ourselves losing weight. When we're singing every day, we can hear our voice getting better. When we're writing a book every day, we can go back and we can read the chapter that we just finished. But the peace and the prosperity and the provision that God provides through study of his word isn't always so obvious. And that's where faith comes in. Faith that God's promise in Psalm 1 about study of his word is true regardless of what our circumstances might be telling us. And while I don't have any sort of magical formula I can give you, I do have four sort of steps that have worked for me in the past that hopefully will work for you as well. Number one, write it down and make sure you give it a time. If something is on our schedule, if it's in our agenda, if we wrote it on our calendar, we're much more likely to do it. You wouldn't miss a haircut or you wouldn't miss a doctor's appointment because you wrote it down in your phone. You set an alarm for it. The same is true if we do that for our Bible study. Number two, have a plan. Don't just sit down and expect God's Spirit to breathe the right verse or the right chapter into your heart. Some days it just doesn't happen. I've made the commitment to read one chapter of scripture a day. Sometimes if the Spirit's moving, I'll read more, but I always read one chapter a day. And when I wake up knowing that that's what I'm going to do, it's much more easy to stay disciplined in it. Number three, Pray for God's help. The last thing that Satan wants you to do is sit down and study your Bible. So he's going to come up with any sort of little distraction that he can give you. Pray for God's protection from that. Pray for focus and pray for the discipline to get into the Word. People who are trying to lose weight use accountability partners to make sure they don't eat junk food. Your accountability partner is almighty and all-powerful. Use that to your advantage. And number four, and this might be the most difficult, but the most important, is just do it. Nothing can replace or compare to the action of just doing. At the end of the day, it's up to you to commit. It might be hard, but trust me, it is worth it. That's all we have for you today. Thanks so much for tuning in. If you haven't seen some of our other recent videos, 
check them out right there. Click on any of them. Also, click around somewhere to subscribe to our channel. And also, don't forget, comment below. I know there's a lot of you who have been watching these videos and you haven't been commenting and asking questions. We are hungry for your questions. Ask us anything and hashtag it AskAnima. You don't have to just comment below. You can put it on Twitter. You can do whatever you want, but don't just sit there and watch our videos. Play your part, ask questions, answer questions, or just comment below and tell us about yourself. We wanna to get to know you because we love you and we think you're awesome. Watch the videos now. It's time for me to dance. Bye now.